my presentation is called the Good Greenhouse Effect because I believe in greenhouses for food instead of, you know, the greenhouse effect. Uh, I want to offset, you know, and so to lower our carbon footprint with agriculture, you know, uh, my main concern is us shipping food 3,000 miles uh, away when really we can grow everything that we are shipping, we can grow it all right here in the community. But where do we start? You know, how do we engage the community? How do we inspire people to want to even go back to uh, that traditional means, I guess. But at the same time, we're not so traditional because we're not focused on soil agriculture. We're now focused on indoor aeroponics, hydroponics, aquaponics, things that are a lot more um, efficient and also require less resources, uh, including a lot less labor, time, um, at the same time, we're also using less resources like water. Um, our main concern is water because we are facing extreme water shortages in the next 10 years. We are exponentially using more water uh, from our prehistoric reservoir, uh, which is not replaceable every year due to agriculture. And a lot of that, you know, agriculture is responsible for at least 70% uh, of water loss. Um, so aeroponics can use 90% less water and that is why this is uh, my focus uh, in greenhouse technology. So my organization is a public charity that is focused on investing in urban agriculture uh, and it's called the Red Giant Union and I'll, uh, there's a video that we made um, after this slide right here that actually explains where I got the name from and um, also kind of what we're doing. But the Red Giant Union, essentially, our, our mission is to supply the uh, public with locally grown non-GMO produce. Um, I don't want to get into the political battle about GMOs. All I know is that we don't necessarily need them for everything. And if we can compromise with the balance and say, you know, instead of using 85% of Indiana's land for GMOs, we can maybe break that down to 20% and the rest be used for locally grown produce using you know, or even, we might not even have to use that much land for, you know, locally grown produce. We can do it indoors, vertically, and uh, it would, we would be able to use the land for other things, you know, like, uh, I don't know, we'll get into that some other time. Um, but, you know, our concern is we want to utilize and pioneer world-leading methods. We don't want to go back, we want to continue innovation, we want to use what we know works today, and, uh, and go forward on that. Um, we, want to strengthen, strengthen, <laughs> we want to strengthen the local food system because uh, people just aren't used to uh, buying their food locally. They're used to going to the grocery store and uh, you know picking up cans of food or you know the sal usual salad greens or whatever. People are just used to the three options of tomatoes, uh, apples, and you know you know three different kinds of each thing or even less. And when we talk about the local food system, we're actually talking about biodiversity and a uh, variety and also more nutritious produce. Because when you ship uh, things in, uh, from thousands of miles away, you're picking them earlier, such as apples and tomatoes. Uh, and 75% of that nutritional content develops in the later stages of ripening. When we pick it early to ship it, we're chemically ripening it and we're not getting the nutritional quality. So local food system is about increasing the nutritional content of food because we can wait until it ripens and it's available right there. And we can also have a greater variety. Instead of having two kinds of tomatoes, we can have you know 10 or 15. We can have all sorts of you know heirloom varieties, purple, blue tomatoes that we don't see in the grocery store. So you know, these are the things that, you know, we lose our interest in food because it's become so generic and uh, just boring, I think, when you go to the grocery store. And uh, that brings me to my core philosophy is that I, I truly believe that food should be an experience, not just a convenience. We've, we've broken it down, you know, in our current economy, food is a complete convenience. It's become McDonald's, you know, and I, I want to see less of that and more of an experience. We can still be convenient, and you know, at the same like that's 
what vertical aeroponics does is it makes, it creates that convenience and at the same time it creates an experience. Um, also, we want to build careers, you know, we want to turn gardens into uh, careers, not just hobbies like they are today. Um, when we think of the local food system, we're not thinking of building a career in agriculture the same way as, you know, we, it was during the pioneering, or during the pioneer era when, you know, people would plant a dozen, you know, varieties of apple trees and have a, you know, a dozen different things to do with them. It would make cider, you know, it, it actually strengthened uh, their local economy because it created a lot of, you know, different uses, you know, um, and it inspired entrepreneurship. So, uh, you know, I want to build a local food system where everybody who's producing food is doing this, not just as a hobby, but it's like, you know, a very well paid off career. And there's already places in the U.S. that, you know, have shown and proven that this works. Um, and so, I'll get now to the video that we put together just to uh, wrap it all up. The stars are a source of inspiration, guidance, and stories. Educators, entrepreneurs, artists, and philosophers, for example, are all stars. Some fizzle out peacefully. Others will explode in a spectacular event that is bright enough to briefly outshine all the stars in the galaxies. It's called a supernova. This is Antares, a red supergiant also known as the heart of Scorpio, lord of the sea, creator of prosperity. It has been said that Antares demands we take a stand for our truth against the established conditions of our personal lives and against the established order of authority directing our lives when those conditions and that authority are no longer in our best interest, nor supporting our evolutionary freedom. And Terry's ensures growth, evolution, and change. It is also expected to supernova. sustenance and survival, and a search for a better way, to do more with less. 200 years ago, 98% of the population was involved with agriculture. Now, less than 2%. Quality has been sacrificed for convenience, and our health is degrading. The majority of food is imported, frozen, or otherwise processed. Commercial production of food is extremely resource intensive. Your average hamburger contains 2,600 gallons of water to produce the beef patty, 5 gallons of water to produce the lettuce, and 15 gallons of water to produce the bread. Right now, water is a national concern. We are facing extreme water shortages in the next 10 years. There's a better way to do more with less. Innovators have transformed agriculture in ways that have yet to become mainstream. The transition is leading to a new agricultural revolution, sprouting first in urban communities where fresh produce is scarce, and reconnecting us with a healthier way of life. The Red Giant Union shares this vision. Since before our foundation as a public charity in November of 2015, Together, we've been working to establish groundbreaking opportunities, integrating world-leading methods. We are addressing the next generation of food challenges while inspiring community engagement. Over 800 million people around the world now encourage you to join this movement, to make a difference, to directly influence the quality and affordability of your food to enable the leadership of your local community to be an agent for change. It's not just farming. We grow food to save the world. And we welcome your donation at redgiantunion.org. Thank you, everyone. So I just want to show you a few 
few slides of you know the actual technology that we can use uh, that's available today, and uh, it's called the Tower Garden. And the, the amazing thing about the Tower Garden is that it's you know a, an aeroponic system that can grow up to 52 uh, plants in less than four square feet of space, and it's easy to maintain. Uh, it doesn't require, you know, you can do it indoors, and if we were to have a community-supported farm that's indoors, uh, people would be more likely to want to be involved with growing their own produce if they know they don't have to deal with weeding, uh, you know, tr trying to make sure that the soil is balanced with pH and the correct, you know, nutrients, you know, correct everything, which is really hard to do if, um, you're, if you don't already have a very fertile uh, soil. And especially around the uh, Wabash River, which is one of the most polluted rivers in the nation, uh, they're finding that they can't uh, farm the land around it necessarily because it's contaminated. So, you know, we have to look for other ways to uh, to do agriculture anyway. Um, So John Mooney uh, is a chef in New York City, and he started with this technology. He's uh, the first restaurant in New York City to utilize the tower gardens on his roof uh, to grow more than 70 varieties of herbs, vegetables, and fruits um, for his restaurant. And he's managed to supply over 60% of the produce for his restaurant uh, 10 months out of the year, which you know is huge on savings. From the rooftops of New York City to the vacant lots of Detroit, there's a growing movement to change the way we eat. Join us as Food Forward explores the explosion of urban agriculture across America and meet the food rebels who are growing food right where we live. My name is John Mooney. I've basically been in the restaurant business my whole life. I've never made money doing anything other than being part of a restaurant crew from start to finish since about 12, 13 years old. I have done some conventional farming projects to supply restaurants that I've done in the past. It's very difficult to manage, very difficult to maintain, so I looked into alternative forms of farming. In an urban setting, I felt with the dead space of the rooftop, the technology was smart. It just makes sense. We're in the West Village of Manhattan. We're standing here in the middle of my uh, my hydroponic rooftop farm. In the beginning, there was a lot of uh, curiosity as to what was going on up here because it looks kind of space age from a distance. And I've explained it by phone or you know in person. And now I'm at the point where I tell everyone you have to see it. The seed sits inside this net, where the roots grow inside the tower. This big cylinder has a pump that trickles water down the sides, and that feeds the roots, and that recycles the nutrients through the bottom is a big base, filling around four gallons of the nutrients, which is fed naturally by gravity. What I do is I pull the cup out of the tower. So you see how nice and lightly colored the roots are, and look how long they get, right? I mean, that's strong. Let's look at this arugula right here, okay? We just pulled that a few hours ago. I broke it down, roots attached. You see what I'm doing. And uh, I believe it totally makes a difference. The flavor is absolutely amazing. When you enter the garden from the stairwell, you open that door. It's kind of like a sanctuary of sorts. And that is, uh, you know, definitely a, a new experience with food for people, especially if you can go into a restaurant and see the chef pick the food and then put it, you know, on your plate. It, it's as if, like, you know, you can't get any fresher than that. Um, so it impacts not only just restaurants, but really all corners of society. You know, it, 
impacts residents, uh, schools. Um, and we'll look at an example of a school in the Bronx that utilizes the same technology in, uh, in their public school. And they actually have the students involved with uh, growing the produce. And you know, that's, that's another thing. It's like we, we're so, uh, we don't really think about uh, the, the lunches that are available today. You know, you go to the public school and it's like, you know, the worst, I just feel like it's the worst food possible. It is. Yeah, it is? Or you're agreeing it is? I agree with you, it is. Yeah, so, and it, that hasn't really uh, changed too much. But it is, there is a surge in um, the amount of schools now who are now focusing on farm to school programs. But at the same time, uh, it's expensive to get into this kind of technology. And that's why I founded this public charity so that we can create that ease of access uh, for, this, to, for the expense in order to actually achieve uh, this kind of mission on, on a massive scale. Um, and it's really our, our intent is to unite the masses under this cause to realize that if we all focus on this one issue, we, we donate uh, to this organization, that we will achieve this mission because it'll, um, it'll just allow, like if, imagine if 10,000 people were to donate one dollar to our organization. That would be ten thousand dollars for us to implement a farm to school program. And if that happened a dozen times over, you know, you, you can just imagine that we're taking that cost away from the school and we're basically just giving it to them and it's because the community came together and allowed it to happen just by giving a little bit. You know, and it's we're not asking a lot from the public, we're we're just asking a very little and you can impact major changes that way. And this is the kind of change I'm talking about. There is a myth that marginalized communities want cheaper food. No, they want healthy food.
and I've teamed up with Chipotle, who shares a similar food philosophy for food integrity and quality, non-GMO. Uh, they agreed to cater all of our events, uh, free burritos, basically, which is a huge incentive, uh, and helps us uh, to really, you know, one, get people to show up, and also uh, realize that, you know, this is something that impacts, that affects uh, businesses too, like restaurants, on a massive scale, and that's why they want to get involved because they realize that by helping us, we're feeding back into the local food system, which will supply them. Uh, and they, you know, they want to get their food from a 150 mile radius, but what if we can break that down to a 50 mile radius, or a 10 mile, or even a 10 block radius? So uh, they realize that vision, and that's why they've, um, or at least a local franchise or a local store. Uh, is, has agreed to cater all of our events in Lafayette. And we're going to try to spread that throughout Indiana as we go um, and raise funds uh, for a farm to school program. Um, and that is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.